Hello, everybody. We are back. We had to reset the camera, so you're looking down on us. Um, this is the um, prepped other side. You didn't get to see pretty much any of this yesterday. Um, but we took all the clay wall off of the remaining side, made sure that everything was as clean as it possibly could be. And once we changed the angle, we saw that there were a little bit of undercuts that we needed to take care of. So that was why we are a little bit later getting started. We had to do a few uh, modifications to the underside where you could see it once it was laying down, but in its upright position when it was being sculpted, um, it's a little harder to see things like that. So we were able to get those things done. Everything has been sealed and released now. So we have our um, 1311 uh, matte finish spray. Let that dry. Did another coat. Let that dry. So we had about Oh, about 20 minutes, I guess, for that. And then we did two coats of our 1310 dulling spray and allowed that to dry. So we're at a point now where everything is sealed and in place. We went ahead and double-checked everything just to make sure that we weren't missing anything. Didn't appear that we were. So went through all the gills and made sure that we had any kind of dust or debris off because um, that's going to be important. And then uh, last minute, we added these uh, little, I don't know if you can see these very clearly, but they're basically just upright pieces of clay just to give us a little bit more of a lip. Now, a lot of this is going to be trimmed off once we demold um, just to give us a little bit more manageable base, but we have the material anyway. And all of this rough edge here, once we get it together, we're going to grind off. So we're, we're going to have basically all of our, you know, details ready to go. Um, and, of course, if we can lighten the weight a little bit, that's cool, too, because we're looking at probably a 75-pound mold. Um, we do need to get um, keys on this, but that'll be very quick. Um, we're going to do that with more of the wet clay. And that's just more of what we did yesterday. You'll remember that was a pretty easy process. So we just make them about an, maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch wide. Sure. We're going to press that in here. And again, we don't want it to go more than about a third in. I mean, a half is safe, but a third should be good. And we're just basically pressing that in. The usual parallel of branching. Mm -hmm. And on this one, we're going to give us probably one, two, three, four. So about every five inches apart, we're going to have another little wedge. And when you're first putting them on, you just taper it down towards the mold, because that's where the edge of the pry bar is going to be. We use a, a large screwdriver from Harbor Freight, because they are cheap. They're easy to find, all sorts of stuff like that. We will have to be careful, just as we did yesterday, we'll have to be careful about um, popping these loose as we're putting our, um, you know, material on there. But this is going to be a lot easier than yesterday because we're not working with a vertical piece, so the, the material actually stays where you want it to rather than wanting to drip off. And this is also going to go, um, I'm sure you guys are happy about this, it's going to uh, go a little quicker. So we're hoping to have this all done within maybe two hours or so, three hours tops. And thank you guys all for joining in again. So we're continuing to just cut that little wedge. This is about as fresh a wed clay as you can get. Um, it definitely works better uh, the fresher it is because it's not uh, kind of going through that leathery phase and giving you all sorts of problems with lifting away. We will have to work pretty quick to get our, our, our initial print coats on because these do tend to dry out quickly because they're so narrow. Um, that's one of the arguments that I use on um, getting that on there after you seal it. Because if you do it um, before you seal it and you're on the raw 
plaster, it tends to soak that moisture out really easy and then it'll pop almost instantly, even if you seal it up with um, acrylic spray because it's drawing the moisture from the underside of it. And leaving a little bit out is okay because remember we're going to grind off some of this so that's also why they're a little bit long at this point. You want to be careful if you get too close to keys. That's another thing because you don't want to ever go into your keys because if you wind up breaking them off, mm. you have issues. You got, oh, you got a knife? Yeah. Here, you can use this one. This, these are coming out a little bit, little bit thick. Just about like that. That's probably enough. This one's a little thick too. And then we're just going to angle that as we cut that taper in. This one's really close to me. Should I move it here? Or was here? Um, I'd really like it about here, so we'll just pull it back from the key just to touch. There's not an exact science to this part of it. It's just about, you know, doing what works for you. I'm nervous about demolding, so that's why I'm going a little bit more with the keys than I normally would. But we want to be sure to have enough pry points so we're not putting stress just on one single area. It's taking very fast. <laughs> oh, is it? Mm -hmm. that one because it has the rounder tip. Yeah, I like the round on mold work. You don't want to cut into the mold at all. But if you got to clean up any kind of areas where the keys are going, you just lift it up and then wipe away the excess. It'll still be fine because it's not near any detail. And this will mark the last thing we have to do for this particular mold. Then we just have to start worrying about the suit. Everything else. Yeah. But that's often the case. You get done with one, and it's like, oh, we're immediate on, on to the next. Because we'll still have to do everything custom. Someone brought up yesterday the existing um, Creature from the Black Lagoon boots, the evidently from the screen mold, but as we were discussing, the original ones actually extended up his calves, and they had either a zipper or some sort of closure in the back. And the boots that you find that are supposedly from original molds are actually like little booties. They only come down like to the ankle. So I don't know if they were from one of the, maybe one of the other movies. I'm not as familiar with them. I've watched them, but I'm not like crazy, crazy like I am about the original creature. But a lot of people do that. They'll post that it's from the original molds, and you always have to check the authenticity of something like that, because if they were a generation apart from it, you know, they're not going to be exact. And we know what happened to the molds that you know, Universal did the project, and then the molds go into storage, and you really don't know what happened to them. Years later, they said that they they uncovered the molds and stuff, but molds that are even a few years old are not always the best. So we're going back to original pictures and 
what we can find out from, you know, as many people who are close to the production as possible, which there aren't many that are still around that like to talk about it. Okay, so we have those. I am going to hit it with a little bit of dulling spray just to make sure I didn't remove any of that dulling spray as we're working around it, because remember, that's a wax base. So we're just going to spray a little bit on right on the keys themselves. Not really going with the crystal clear on that, although it could help, but um, pry points are a little different than anything that has to hold detail. And one thing to note here is we talked a little bit about expansion and how this material works versus <laughs> other materials. And if you notice, there is a slight, I'm not sure if you can see it from your angle, but I did want to at least, um, you know, address this. There's a slight gap uh, around certain parts of it. And with something like this, because there's so much surface area, we know that the model itself didn't move within that mold. And that's because of the slight expansion and contraction that this stuff goes through. So it did cause a little bit of a gap, and that's fairly common. Obviously, if we were able to get everything done yesterday, we could have minimized that a little bit. But at this point, we're going to have a flashing line that we have to clean up anyway. But you're literally cleaning it up with cuticle nips and, um, you know, cosmetic scissors. So that should clean up pretty well. So now we're pretty much ready. As soon as this starts to, you know, glaze over, which it looks like it is, and we're going to go in. Um, normally, I would use the one-inch brush on details like this, and then go to the larger brush for the rest. But since we are out of the two-inch, this will serve. We'll just have to move a little bit more quickly. And we're starting with. Um, is that a that's a two batch um, or a one? No, it, it, I have. Four of them already? Okay, so we're doing one batch. One batch. I, I was confused and stupid yesterday, so I wasn't paying attention. But we've got the uh, one batch, which is one part powder. Uh, I'm sorry, two part powder to one part water. So the water is always less than what your powder is going to be. Hey, Ryan. Yes, this was a long process yesterday. We got the two sides done. Um, Normally, you can get a mold like this done in one day, but we actually had two independent halves on the back, and then we're doing the front today. So we are ready to start. Same process as yesterday. I know it's out of camera range because we've got it set up a little bit differently, but we're mixing the hydrocal. This is regular old hydrocal, um, and it's got to go through its cracked earth, dry cracked earth look, and then mix it, make sure the, te the texture and the viscosity is good, and then we're going to start applying it. Hello, Jean, and thank you guys all for uh, tuning in again to see this wrap up. In a little while, we won't even see his face anymore, at least until we demold. And then you'll only see his negative face. Yeah, until we do the casting and latex, this is the last we'll see of him. And you kind of resolve yourself to the fact that once it comes out of the mold again, it's going to be pretty much torn up because of undercuts and stuff grabbing. Plus, we will have to heat up the mold to make it a little easier to demold the monster clay. I'll just let you know when someone writes something because I can't read that at all. I think Jean said something, and it says either if badly or if buddy. Hi, hi, buddy. Okay. You fail your eye test. <laughs> I told you, I need new lenses. We would normally have someone uh, fielding comments and stuff like that that come through, but we're trying to monitor them as best as we can in case you guys have questions. But it's kind of like once we start molding, we got to pay attention to so much stuff. We can't always catch it. But I do try to go back, and if there's anything that we did not address in the videos themselves, I try to answer them after the fact. Because we did have some great questions last uh, from yesterday's stuff. I mean, I could try to read them, but it's going to end up like Mad Libs. Mm. Yeah, filling in the blanks. But yeah, we're very excited to see this um, actually get done today.
And then our next thing coming up this week, we do have a lot of administrative stuff that we have to do for the event itself. Uh, mostly getting those vendor packages ready and the sponsorship packages. We're waiting on final approval on those. And then those will start going out. We will probably have to make another trip down to Silver Springs. Um, uh, a friend of mine uh, offered to do a nice drone flyby so we can actually get aerial photos of the uh, venue. And then we can start planning out where booths are going to go because we have enough room for 70 booths and then food trucks and stuff like that. So we want to measure everything out and make sure that we have all of that taken care of. That's right. That's the water. Oh. The alcohol, the alcohol bottle is slightly yellower. Oh. No, that is not the alcohol. We need the... Is that it up there? Yeah. I think you're out. Yeah. That's good. That will work. You went up to it fast today. Why is that? It's already getting a little warm. <laughs> Burping out air bubbles as we speak. Hmm? Oh, yeah. oh no, it's funny. As I was tapping the uh, container, there was a cup of water over there that was doing the T Rex ripple thing from Jurassic Park. T-Rex, what T-Rex? And we've also pre-cut our burlap. The last of the burlap we're going to need for this molding process. All right, so we have our de-aired. Again, when you're mixing it after you do the vibration, do slow and controlled mixing. And then we're going to start at the top just like we did, making sure that we're burping out any air bubbles. And this is our detail print coat. So we're going to make sure, again, we're looking for coverage over the whole thing, making sure we got plenty of coverage in all of the wrinkles and creases, because his face is very textured, which makes removal very fun. He said, buy in. Because even if you, uh, yeah. Even if you put as much as you can on there, as far as detail and release to, to what you hope would accommodate, it never seems like it's quite enough for this. That's when we usually bring out the hot dogs. Mm -hmm. And you guys are also going to get to see um, a different mold technique than we used yesterday because this is now horizontal. But we are going to make every attempt to show you how we actually do, um, you know, the uh, actual splash coat, which is another thing that they call this. Got to pay special attention to all between the gills because we want to pick up all those details. So we're going to make sure we tap out any kind of air bubbles that might get trapped. Yeah, it's been doing that. Okay. Nope, it's doing that everywhere. Yeah, this is a little bit thin of a mix. But again, we have that luxury since it's horizontal. Yesterday, our batch was a little bit thicker because of the um, that it was vertical and it was going to drip off if we weren't careful. Some things you have to watch for in any direction, no matter what direction you're doing it. I'm definitely wanting to spend as much time as I have to on all these gill details. It's not the end of the world if we get a little bubble in one of the gills, but we want to avoid that as much as possible. And definitely along our mold wall, we want to make sure that that wall right now that we have in stone is going to be bubble free as possible because if you have a bubble up against the wall it's going to be a weak spot and 
will also be resorting to our canned air to just verify that we have burped out as much as we can. This is going in pretty well, though. Definitely want to do a little kind of splash thing over the little keys or the pry points. That way we're not actually hitting it with the brush too hard. Yeah, where it's really thin, we're going to go ashy just by drying out a little bit and absorbing into the, the uh, mold wall, especially. That hydro power is so thirsty. Yeah, it's doing to itself what it kind of does to the latex. It sucks all the moisture out of the layer we're putting on there. So we do have to be really careful. Watch especially around the base of the gills on that side. I can't really see how that's going but we want to make sure that it's not drying too quickly and getting any kind of peaks or valleys or anything in there. And then we're going to continue almost, once we get a coat on there and we're sure that we're happy with the placement and we're content that we don't have any problems, burping out all of our air bubbles. I'm just using a little bit of canned air. It's a little bit easier for us to use this than going in with our compressor and having to fight that but just making sure that we get as much of the air bubbles out and the compressor would like you to pull the fuse and yes if you want to check out that side just very light air pressure And finally, now that I have everything around the base, last concern is making sure that the area that really isn't going to be kept in it, the area that extends below the bib, um, we're putting the material on that last. Want to come check it, Scott? Sure. I'll keep doing drills. Okay. A few that was perfect. A few pinhole bubbles, but yeah, no, that looks good. watching that side with the gills especially and this is the technique that's called the splash coat it can sometimes get a little bit messy but by doing it this way you're avoiding the continual brushing and it builds up the, um, the layer a little bit faster as long as you're not whipping up the material too much and getting a bunch of air into it you shouldn't have a problem doing this way, and it's a little bit easier to control. But as you can see, for the most part, the brushes are not even hitting the, the model. We're just dripping the material in there. If we do have to tap it, we're going with a loaded brush and kind of just going up against the edges, being careful that we're not going to get any air in there because that's going to be horrible to get a bubble at this point, especially with all the detail. It's more like you're touching it with the material on the brush, not the brush itself. Right. The brush is simply a delivery device at that point. Making sure, again, that we don't get those little areas that also, um, you know, uh, these, any kind of, what am I trying to say? The fish eyeing, because that can sometimes happen especially on something like this that has such flat areas to it now. And also keeping it from being too, too matte, yes. out too fast. Yeah, around the, the flange, we definitely have that matting that we have to keep hitting it. It's a different it's, it's a different reason that it's matting out, though. It's not like it's going through its chemical change. 
So the material will still be very easy to move around if we weren't careful. So that's why, again, we're just doing it with the very end of the brush, just delivering the material to that flange and keeping it wet. I'm having a little bit of pressure uh, with the brush and the flange just to get some air bubbles. Yeah. Because it's curing as soon as it touches, so. Or at least dehydrating. Right, so it kind of makes a bubble as you leave it. I like to pretend I'm Jackson Pollock from things. Yeah, the front will definitely use far less material overall just because the the back fin took a lot of material and a lot of the more a lot more time. And remember one of the main things with this is, you know, when you're trying to judge how fast it's curing and everything. It doesn't go through its cure process until it is able to heat and then cool down. Up until that point, it's still very green. And I can feel by what we're dealing with here that it is starting to cream. It's a little bit different consistency. It goes from a thinner consistency to almost a softer feel to the material. How are we getting coverage on that side? Are we happy? I'm pretty happy. I'm getting here. Okay. There was a weird Sorry, I'm flipping on you. <coughs> and you don't see it off camera, but Ted is going to start the next four rationing of the material because we want to go as fast as this starts to mat out we want to be able to get more material on that way we're going to get the best chemical bond we can in here I mean you always will have uh, what they call a mechanical bond when you're dealing with this stuff because of the texture of the piece and you know the contours that are on the the mold at this point, but you want a chemical bond. Now there are always things that you can add to this. An old trick with the UltraCal was adding a product called Acryl 60. And you could do that with taking some of the Acryl 60. You get that at a hardware store. It's actually a product for plastering and stucco. But it almost is like a almost like a white glue. It's an acrylic base, I think, but it's it's like a almost like a white glue that gets added into the UltraCal and gives it a little bit more, a um, little lo longer life, I guess you would say. Makes it a little bit more resilient and helps with delamination in case, you know, layers start to, would start to delaminate. It acts as a, a kind of a primer and stuff. But for something like this, I don't use the acryl 60 at all because it also would inhibit the water absorption or the liquid absorption in the case of the latex and we don't want that stuff is beaming enough that uh, it doesn't splash as well mm -hmm. want to come check the side real quick Scott since we're hearing hearing the end of it splash like yeah if you <laughs> want to look over here as well make sure we keep wet edge on the flange as well. Okay, dipping over here real quick. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. Okay. Anytime I see sort of one of those little holes start to pop up, I... Okay, start the mix. Yep, go ahead and start it.
again, we're going to continue moving our material around so it stays a little more liquidy. But we're going to go ahead and just keep that nice wet edge on our flange because that's sucking a lot of moisture. Double checking any kind of caves that form. Especially the underhangs around the gills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the underhangs around the gills. I don't know if you can hear Ted, but they are very important to not miss in this one. Every sculpture is different, and you're not going to have the same thing in everything. But you want to make sure that at least in that situation that you're able to keep any kind of undercuts from forming that will prevent you from getting more material into those areas that need ultimate strength. If we're doing anything, we're just delivering material. We're not kind of moving it around, just kind of glazing over the top, using the weight of the material itself to kind of distribute on the surface. The only time I sort of take the edge of my brush and do a tacky thing like this, just removing material a little bit, is when I see there's a hole or a peak that's going to be problematic. Exactly. Because, again, this is not going through its cure cycle yet. It's just starting to set. So the only place that it's drying out is around the flange, which again, that's the moisture being sucked in to the bottom half of the mold from the top liquid. I think we're Yep, that's definitely done. So now we go by waiting for this to start to ash up here. Even though this is starting to uh, turn matte, it's not going through the cure phase yet. The moisture is just being wicked out of it. So up here is where we're really going to look because that's against the non-porous material. That's kind of our clock. A lot of pinhole bubbles in there. Where? It's very slightly here and there. That'll be okay. So minor. I was wondering if it has to do with how like, extra, extra humid it is today. Yeah, it's a little more humid. Last night it started getting pretty humid as well. And by the end of the day yesterday, it was like a, a sauna in here because all the moisture that was coming out of the mold and the heat as it was heating up, it was starting to get a little bit stuffy. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you, Mac, for showing up again. I know that you're as excited as I am to see this done today. <laughs> I think we've been like the, the three amigos. Uh, we've had Mac on a lot, Gene Crow, we've had RJ Grady. These guys are like big creature fans, so. Yeah, Kilted Creature, yeah. I think that he is earned, I, I, I think he might earned the top moniker, he maybe. <laughs> and he's got a surprise coming for the event as well, so I can't wait to for him to be able to reveal that, so. It was a bit of a feat just to get this thing horizontal as well. You might be able to see it from shot. We have some wood on this side, wood on that side, kind of bracing it, pad underneath, and it's resting on that back fin of, you know, mold part. But because there's so much surface area and we haven't done the actual separation yet, it's very unlikely that it would actually separate. But I will definitely be sweating bullets once we get a little bit closer to, you know, this being full because then we've got another probably 35 pounds on the mold. But we've got enough padding. We've got a pillow up front by the head. We've got a, another brace, like I said, so. Need to... Uh... Adjust the uh, the grub screw on this. Oh, uh, it's a little loose. It's turning a little. Yeah. No, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right now the first thing I'm going to do is make sure we didn't miss anything. Make sure we have adequate material in any of the undercuts first. Yeah, and I got rid of this very much. I'm going to try and be a cave as much as possible area. Yeah. And I always find that if you're pushing the material, not necessarily brushing it into where you need it, but kind of flowing in front of it and pushing it, 
it kind of burps up in there and knocks any air bubbles that you might have without you actually hitting your brush to it. So that's good for a multitude of reasons. And then certainly under this gill is important because it's so close to the detail. We want to make sure that we get enough material in there and burp out any air bubbles. Because if we have any situation where an air bubble is present and then we try to pull casts, it could break that mold at that area. And at least that's where all our detail is. So it's crucial in these first two or maybe even three layers to make sure you're burping out every little air bubble. But again, you're not brushing as much as you are tapping and running the material over. If you run off with your material and you no longer see material going, but you're catching a lot of brush strokes, then you have too little material on your brush. So it's almost like you're painting it with a whipped cream. You want to see material, no brush strokes, if that makes sense. And that's how you're also going to build up um, layers. the layers that you need, the material depth that you need. Because if you're brushing it, a lot of times you you wind up brushing off more than you're actually leaving on the piece. And that's why you kind of do a splash coat. And whether you're using an actual splash coat or a variation of it, it's all about just delivering material. And then as many people as are helping, what we always do is watch each other and watch areas that we may not be able to see because you don't have a line of sight on a lot of this stuff. And if one of us is looking from a different angle and says, oh, you missed a spot, that's a huge help. Sometimes when you see those little surface air bubbles pop up, you don't even need to use the canned air. You can do light um, blowing on it, basically. That'll break the surface tension and pop those air bubbles. But if you get some that, like, especially in the first little area where you have a lot of detail, you want to be sure to burp those out. Definitely want to thank everyone for their support and their help over these last two days as well. Um, you know, you guys sharing and liking the page, and we're seeing the uh, the counts of people that are actually interested or going to the gillibration have been ticking up, and that's that's really good. How that helps us up out is not just knowing that people are interested in coming. But when we go to talk to potential vendors or when we go to, you know, special guests that are going to be there, um, we can say this is the interest level. We're expecting a good following, a good turnout for this. And it gives us kind of advanced armament on what to expect. But so far, everyone has been great and very excited and wanting to contribute. We've had a lot of great ideas from people, especially when it comes to marketing, when you're getting... A lot of support from both local and um, more far-reaching radio stations and television stations and podcasts and magazines. Everyone seems to really be getting excited about this, which is a good thing. Now all we have to do is what we do. Make messes. Yes. Hey, administrative stuff is definitely act, uh, <laughs> actual work. I think we spent more time last week doing administrative stuff than we were able to get working on the, the molding, hence 
doing it over the weekend because with that stuff you have to hit people during the week because they disappear on the weekends and you don't hear from them again until Monday so any uh, potential business that needs to get done for it or sponsors especially you got to hit them when they're in the office extra bubbly goodness how's that side are we getting a good good creamy coat on it now I think so you want to come uh, rotate real quick sure if you would just get some coverage on this I shoulder think. area mm -hmm. that's what I was working <clears throat> on this side as well that's good coverage the gills keep wanting to have little surface bubbles so I keep letting more material fall yeah You know, that leading down thing you taught me. Yes. Oops. Let gravity do the work for you. It's always easier. One of our favorite slogans. Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever possible, gravity will do a lot of work, a lot of work for you. At least our keys are nice and covered, or our pry points are nice and covered. They're not going to pop off on us. If you're hearing a strange wishing noise, it's not static. It's the palm tree against the side of the building. <laughs> it's windy today. The beach to be flat. Windy okay. and humid in Florida. Rain's coming. Go fade. And this is around the time. Unfortunately, we're seeing less and less of the creature, but at least it's kind of protected in its little bubble. You know, it's got its first couple of coats on. Uh, Mac, make Dermot. Dermot? Dermot? Yeah. Yes. It says, uh, do you have a secret squirrel latex to use on your mask? Not really. I mean, we use... Um, we use like the Monster Makers latex a lot. They're probably the best, um, at least what I have. I know that um, there are a number of different people that actually sell it. BJB, I think, has their own uh, type. Um, but I think that it's just a matter of what what you're into, the kind of result that you're looking for, the fluidity of it. But no, we just use the regular Monster Makers. I'm getting moisture. Pretty lips on the shoulder. Okay. Normal, but not necessarily wanted. She was saying she's getting some water ribbons that start to form, so we'll probably lighten up with our application now. Well, also, it was a, a little more watery one than, than we were using yesterday because we didn't have to uh, fight gravity. Right. I'm pulling from the uh, shoulder base up a little bit, trying to catch it. Again, we're watching that area where the model hits the mold wall because we don't want to see that get any kind of cliffs in it and then it's just gentle application of material over what we've already done and between the stippling or the the splash coating and this it gets a nice defined thickness on there Preserved for uh, all eternity. Greg Altman said, 41 and sunny in Queen Rapids, Minnesota. Oh, God. We're, I know you guys are probably tired of the cold, but boy, we're jealous down here. Uh, I don't know. Doing I'm, this I'm stuff fine. In 40 degree <laughs> weather would not be good. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm happy with the, what is it, 85? I liked our recent trip to Tennessee, though, going up near Pigeon Forge. 
and waking up in the morning to 50 degree weather and watching the sunrise come over the mountain range right on the Smokies it was very cool. I think that ranks up there with at least as good a time as meeting my friend the llama during the llama trek. That was pretty cool too. <laughs> I like Mr. Long. I'll be, I'll be honest. I know we just talked about that this morning, but for about five seconds, I thought to myself, wow, you met the Dalai Lama? Yeah. No, no that was not it. I know, I know. Oh, wow. Heavy moisture. Should I go ahead and apply more? or? No, we should be good. Just leave it. Yeah, just leave it and catch it in the next layer. Okay. Is it very deep? It's doing some craggy stuff. Uh oh. It really is. I'm getting it down here, too. Mm-hmm. On this shoulder. I'll make this one thicker. You want me to? Yeah, I guess we can add a little more material and kind of drag it up. Don't hit it with your brush too hard, but drag it up. Like whipped cream. Definitely a cool whip right now. So another buttercream? Yeah, we changed it up, Rob. Um, we figured you guys would want to see straight on. See what we were working on. I got a nice big stick right there. So satisfying to cover up those clips and crags and Get it all nice and rounded and filled in. Oh, I can imagine, Greg, beyond cabin fever. Because this was a harsh winter for everyone. Uh, she says it's done with winter. Yeah. Cabin fever from being inside so much. I hear that. I lived in Pennsylvania for 13 years. I love Florida. Woo! <laughs> This is about the end of the use of this bucket. I think Greg said something else again. I cannot read it from here. I... That was the statement on the 41, or the cabin fever. Not the Oh, passing it on me. It's reads. Time for new glasses. Yeah, it reads to me like, uh, with a bayonet, calm, how we free. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what it says. <laughs> <laughs> because eyes. But yeah, we're all a little punchy, I think, today after our marathon yesterday. It was a crazy, crazy day. And I won't even go into the personal stuff that we had to deal with with one of our kids. So that was even adding to the drama. I'm just glad there were no cameras following us around like some other thing that I know. Like reality shows? Yeah, reality television shows talking about all the other drama. Oy vey. It's almost like the older I get, the more I realize that my, my father, when he would say, it's always something, I know what he means. And I also know my mom trying to curse me and saying the opposite. You know, you were a good kid. I hope you have kids just like you because I was an easy kid. I was really, I was really a good boy. All I wanted to do is sculpt and build models and all that stuff. But I don't know how I got some of the kids that I have like a constant getting a little personal it's it's like a constant game of who can get our goats more Ta tag team assholes okay i'm gonna be good it's your turn to be a jerk <laughs> but 
since I got, um, looks like we have uh, 11 viewers currently. I don't know how many of you guys that are watching now are planning on, oh, 10, someone left, sorry, um, planning on coming to the event. But if you are planning on coming to the event, or you would like to give contributions on what you think we should have at the event, um, you know, please feel free to either do it here or on the Gilibration page. We are open to suggestions. Like I've said from the beginning, this is an event for fans, by fans. So we are going to have um, a lot of different panels, um, people that would want to talk on certain aspects of the creature or making movies or the makeup aspect of things, producing things. Okay, um, yes, Matt, I, I assume you're talking about um, the uh, Give Kids the World. Um, is that what you were referring to? Soup's on. <laughs> Soup's on. Oh, yeah, so this is a little bit thicker. And thank you, Greg. I appreciate the shares. I've seen a lot of good things coming from those, so very exciting. Okay, Mac. Yes, the um, this all started a couple of years ago. Um, for those that didn't hear yesterday, um, I was on Face Off, and because of that, it put me into being a reality celebrity, which is kind of weird concept for me um, but I was contacted by uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Nunez and he runs Hearts of Reality which is a charity organization that raises money for Give Kids the World and I had heard about Give Kids the World before and um, one of the guys that actually did a lot of the artwork out there the, the scenic stuff Pete, he used to come into our shop when I sold materials, and he would ask questions and buy materials and that sort of thing, and I heard about him, and it was a neat organization, but this was the first time that I really got asked, hey, would you be a part of Hearts of Reality, because I was on a reality television show. It's like, absolutely. You know, I know the organization. It's a good organization. So that was my first anything to do with it, but... In what I do, it's so specific. There's me, and David O'Connell also participates out there, and and uh, Emily Serpico, and Stephanie Masco now. So we're basically the makeup people there. And there's Big Brother and Survivor and Naked and Afraid and all sorts of different reality television shows. And I got to thinking a couple, a couple of years ago, after my first time diving into uh, what that was, how can I bring my talents... The so that's when I kind of started thinking about I could sculpt something, I could do something during the year that would build interest or at least get some attention to give kids the world, um, but what? And then um, we got the idea, what if we were to make an event that could benefit give kids the world, partner with them on the administrative end of things, do a true nonprofit fan event, and what better to do that with then Creature from the Black Lagoon. It was coming up on its 65th anniversary, and we're like, oh, well, if we plan long enough, we can get this to happen. So that's what started started this thing. But we have been associated with Hearts of Reality and Give Kids the World. This is one organization that is just amazing here in Florida. They uh, work kind of like with uh, Make-A-Wish in that you get kids that are either terminally, terminally ill or dealing with life-threatening situations they come to the Give Kids the World Village, and they get to forget that they're ill for a while. They've got 24-hour ice cream parlors and workout rooms, because it's not just for the kids that are going there that are ill. It's for their families, their siblings, their grandparents. And, uh, you know, it's a worthwhile organization. So that's why we're trying to do something that's good for the fans. It's going to bring attention and celebrate the birthday of the creature from the Black Lagoon. Give us a chance to celebrate the actors that are still with us and bring some much needed attention to Silver Springs because that was closed as a state or closed as a theme park and the state purchased it. Florida bought it and the 
state parks are now running it. So when you say, oh, we're doing it at Silver Springs, they're like, oh, that place closed. No, it's a state park. It still functions. They still do the glass bottom boats. They still do the the uh, camping and all that stuff. They've limited how much other stuff that they do there because it was an operating theme park, but they still have a lot going on. So, and then, of course, uh, another thing that I want to bring attention to um, for this sort of thing is the film industry here in Florida, which is really suffering. Until recently, we have seen no movement on that whatsoever. So... Now it's like it's coming to a head and more people are talking about it, probably because of Georgia's success. As of uh, 2016 or 17, I think it was, $14 billion in added revenue. We went up and visited Sonoya, Georgia recently. Some friends were up there. And it's amazing to see this town of Sonoya, Georgia, where Walking Dead is filmed. Um, they went from having six shops on their main street and now the every shop is booked every shop is full and there's a lot of success for the people that immediately live there as well as the uh, outskirt areas and of course that doesn't even touch on Atlanta which is about I guess about 30 minutes away from Sonoya 30 45 minutes away and everyone is profiting and yet you can't get Florida to really look at the film industry and see that it could be something that could add to what the parks offer, such as Disney, Universal, it's like they have that tourism dollars coming in, so they don't care that they're not making all the money on the other revenue. Wasn't but Stranger Things also filmed in Georgia? I don't know if they were, but there's so much that's filmed up there. It's kind of like you lose track until you watch a movie, and then you see the Georgia Peach and Georgia Film Council show up. It's like, ah, yeah, there's another one. All the Disney stuff was filmed up there, I think... Um, Guardians of the Galaxy and the, some of the Marvel uh, Avengers movies, the current mm -hmm. ones. Marvel's up there. So Marvel's doing a lot there. And you'd, you'd think Disney would want to shoot in their own backyard. Yeah. Yeah, but Disney doesn't even have Pretty real working sure studios out there anymore. the whole world is their backyard at this point. Yeah. So we're trying to really bring a lot of attention to a lot of things, but the first and foremost is give kids the world. That's got to gotta be a thrust because, you know, the, the amount of kids, when you figure that most of their little um, houses, because they do have, it's like a neighborhood, it looks like a neighborhood, um, all of their little houses are filled. There are a lot of kids that are going through, through some serious stuff, and it definitely puts it in perspective with your own kids, that at least they're healthy. They may be jerks, but they're healthy. And... It's a fire under us to kind of help out where we can. But we're hoping we can bring some attention to them. I know, Chelsea, your mom, wasn't she looking into volunteering out there? Mm-hmm. So she, fly, she used to fly so frequently she'd run into kids all the time. Yeah, because kids are coming from all over the world. Or all over the United States to give kids the world. But. That it would always make her happy talking to them or seeing their families, going to a place where they can relax and be happy. Yeah. She was a pediatric nurse for a number of years as well, so that's near and dear to her heart. We getting good coverage on that side too? Oh, I think so. You want to come do another trip? I trust you. I've seen the last few layers and they look really good. Just be sure we're getting adequate coverage because mm -hmm. it's starting to cream now which is good i even found an under uh like a half crusted over bubble that popped when i went over it oh good and i filled it in and grew in it how's that water that's kind of draining off there gone good it's all sucked up mm -hmm. yeah sometimes this stuff uh tends to get like little water tracks that start to form out of the material this and any kind of plaster really Ultra Cal and Hydro Cal do it. It's just got a little bit of moisture that kind of congregates and then forms a little river in your material. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Some people say that it could be the age of the, the Hydro Cal or the age of the Ultra Cal that you're using, but I find that it just happens so often you just deal with it. Sometimes if it's really bad, you sop it up with a paper towel and keep going. It can sometimes weaken your material, so if you have a lot, make sure that you're um, ratio is good, your mix ratio.
I think it's safe to say we're probably ready for our next batch to portion out. This will be our um, our first burlap coat. So we're moving, as you can see, a lot quicker, not having to deal with that big old back fin. Yes, Camberry Marble is very huge up there. I wish we could get some of that down here, not to take anything from Georgia per se, but there's a lot of stuff that we could do here as well. And it's just not even a consideration because they did away with the tax incentives. And we had it before a lot of people in 89 with the Hollywood East thing. Or it's good for jungles and swamps. And hopefully we'll get a little bit more attention to local filming as well, because we do have a film foundation here locally in Ocala. It's a volunteer thing, but we do have that volunteer base that's trying to do things with the festival and the, you know, the uh, basically all that stuff. Um, getting festival people here to show movies, and you know, it's a lot of work that they're doing. But could you imagine if we actually had? filming going on here. I think the last major film that we had here in Ocala was Jeepers Creepers, if I'm not mistaken. And that was a while ago. That was the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Early 2000s, maybe. So that should happen. Uh, yes, because this is the burlap, first burlap layer. And have those been dampened already, or no? No, they have not. Okay. So let's put this in. And... Are, we, yeah. are we dampening them this time? Yes. Slightly. We did that last time and last night. By dampening the uh, the burlap, you have less chance of it drawing the water out of it. So even slight dampening is going to be a good thing. Stranger Things was filmed in Atlanta. It was. And surrounding town areas. Nice. So that means similar. Probably. And it's amazing when you go to Sonoya, if you guys are anywhere near Sonoya, Georgia, you should check out their main town there because literally it's right at the gates of Alexandria. So everything else was was filmed like adjacent to or blocks away, all the different houses that are set up there. Um, you know, the, the houses are actually owned by other people. So we were hearing from um, a local guy, Chris Twelman, who's a friend of mine, uh, the German Abraham, he was telling us cool stories about how people were annoying the uh, house, the owners of the homes, because they would go up, oh, I want to see the pudding house, where Carl sat on the roof and ate pudding, and they're showing up to these new homeowners, watching their every move and taking pictures of their house. It's a little creepy. So if you do go there, be careful. Don't don't go creeping out on people. <laughs> they tend not to like it. <laughs> Speaking of Stranger Things, Scott, did you see the season three trailer? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm so good. Cannot wait. And that series is really well done. Mm -hmm. Fourth of July can't come soon enough. Yep. And tonight is the uh, season finale of Walking Dead. Ooh. You guys excited so, for that? A little. Not giving out any spoilers, but last week was a real rough week for fans. I almost don't want to be a fan of that show anymore because it gets so weird. <laughs> I wish that I could disconnect myself a little bit from it, but it's hard because so many of our friends are either extras or work closely with it or are included in like the tours that they do. So it's hard for us to disconnect ourselves from it, but it's hard to watch. Characters that you really grow to like can be gone like that. Mm, that's why I can't watch that or Game of Thrones. Yeah. Rewatching Parks and Rec, though. Yes. That's kind of Marvel related since Chris Pratt's in that. I do not want to connect those two universes. Yeah. You got a comment, but once again, cannot tell what it says. Yeah, he did something stupid on Parks and Rec, though, and half of the office disappeared or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Avengers oh, reference, sorry. No. I told you I haven't seen it yet. 
Hello, John. How are you, man? Listen, I am still... So glad to see you here. I am still mostly spoiler-free, and I am so impressed with myself. Because you know I'm on Reddit and the internet all the time. Yes. yes. I've only... I, I know... think I think I know maybe five people total from Endgame. That's how little spoiler I've had. And I told you, my big plan. We're going to reserve the movie seats for Endgame. Yeah. We're going to watch it the night before. If, uh, if not, we don't get, like, a later showing. We watch it that afternoon, drive over to the theater, and then I see it. I won't have to wait a whole year. Ha-ha! <laughs> yeah, I, I avoid anything like that. I avoid uh, if I'm scrolling through and I see anything that even looks remotely like it, I don't watch it. i got to pull away and not say, you know, because there are things that I don't mind seeing behind the scenes on, and then there are things that I would rather avoid. We got a couple of brushes somewhere. Thick ones. You're welcome, John. I appreciate everyone hanging around and seeing what we're doing. Yeah, we had a couple more like this that we washed out yesterday that I was just going to use to tamp out the, right. the burlap. Are they maybe in the stack of buckets there? No, they were separate from it. Hold it aside. Uh, and fortunately, someone posted a bunch of the posters from Endgame. Mm, I've seen them. Different those, colored posters. I, you know, I have two brain cells rubbed together, so I figured it out very quickly. And then you scroll by going, ah, darn it. Yeah. Well, we've got the one brush. As we're getting this on, if you can do most of the tamping, sure I'll can. try to get it with my fingers on this side, and we'll just keep working. I'll just run around the table. And okay. we'll do two at a time on this. <laughs> We won't be fighting gravity this time. Yeah. I was going to say, are you going to be doing a wicked song? And again, we are going to be very careful about plan strength. Just be sure to burp out as much plaster and air. I'm glad everyone is finding this interesting. To us, it's often, you know, a means to an end, but it's an enjoyable process. It's strangely satisfying. I should never show you that subreddit. Oh, yeah, the oddly satisfying subreddit. That's pretty cool. Just working in all the little nooks and crannies. And if you're trying to save time, you can double up your layers of burlap. Just make sure that you get material through the fibers. Very, very important. And I'm actually overlapping close to the sculpt. I'm going up about a quarter inch or so from the flange. So I've got most of the flange sticking, or most of the burlap sticking on the flange side, and then I'm going up the sculpt wall about a quarter of an inch and that way we've got strength on that little 90. You need any tamping over there? I probably do. I'm trying to rip it out but not the most successful in places. Wants to, it always just wants to form gaps. Yeah, but that's another reason we got to fill some of those areas under the gills to create a uh, kind of like a just a little draft that it's not going to be fighting to wiggle down into those areas. And then by the time you tamp it and backfill it with a little bit of plaster, you know you've got a good bond. This is the same concept as the plaster bandages for strength. In a mother mold, but we're just using the burlap up against the, the hydrocal to give it a little bit more strength. That way if we happen to drop a mold or it's got stress on it, it's not going to fall apart.
going to it. No way I can blow into it for a while. Yeah. But we may be able to get away with just two. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. On the vertical, anyway. Where are you going to Once we get these in there, we'll be able to just concentrate on the remaining layers. Especially considering that we have so much weight on the back. As long as we have enough material to do what it's supposed to do, I don't want to overwhelm the weight that much. Okay, that's an exceptionally long thing. Fold it in half, maybe. <laughs> Two of them. Ah, one and a half. I always hate when you get like those super random long ones in your burlap mix and then yeah. you get a super short one, you're like, oh, this is very helpful. And for those that were mentioning it yesterday, you know, we were talking about, oh, you never get, got to see this stuff on face off. You know, this is kind of why, because they were, you know, they're an action show. They try to, you know, focus on the action of the job and the drama. The glory. Yeah. yeah, this is this is the real stuff, the stuff you don't see that takes so long. And I think it shows, like, you know, the way that they approach it, not necessarily throwing, throwing dirt at them, but it's like when you have a client that says, oh, it looks so easy, that's kind of why. It's like they're seeing all the all the quick stuff and that it goes so fast and it must not take you long to do that but they don't see the remaining 18 hours where you've been designing and sculpting and molding and all of that casting parts and fabricating stuff or all the planning that goes into it or the planning yeah concept art the uh figuring out mechanics and goodness knows what yeah could be anything really and then you have um, Michael Westmore, Mr. Westmore comes through and gives you ideas, and then oftentimes you're trying to incorporate those ideas into your mix. <laughs> and shoot your whole idea. <laughs> he was pretty good with that with me. Mm -hmm. Most times when he would come by, by the time he came by, I was already done with a lot of the design and the sculpting. There were a few times that, you know, I didn't necessarily think that it fit my my design but I always took his his recommendations to heart oh sorry it's fine splashing you it's all right I wear shop clothes we got a whole ball variant over here See if it can suck up anymore. Good thing we're not an ASMR show. The what? But it's a good thing we're not an ASMR show. ASMR. It's the audio. Ah, uh, yes. Just the, uh, the brush noises alone. <laughs> yeah. And get us demonetized. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I'm going to have to tamp this in. I'm probably going to need another batch pretty quick. Do you want to come check the tamping on my side? i got to get this down first. Just keep, keep, moving. keep moving material. And in the meantime, I'm going to get this covered here. You also experiencing the thing where every time you get a fresh stroke, another bubble pops up? Oh, yeah. That's not necessarily uncommon. No. As long as we get good coverage on it and make sure we got material through the uh, the weave and burp out any air bubbles, especially under the gills, because that's where we're going to need ultimate strength. Eventually, with it creaming like it is, it will fill in and stay filled in. But yeah. But unfortunately, we may need to do one more coat of burlap with what we have left. 
so maybe we'll hit that first and then focus on this corner because I know I'm really light in the shoulder. Yeah. The head is good, the shoulder is a little light. Needs to be rounded, right? Ideally. What's that? Ideally you want a nice little round corner. As long as it's covered, mostly, is what I'm worried about. We've got to have coverage. We've got to have at least a couple of layers in there, whether it's in a single, you know, single application, but two layers of burlap. But there are some areas that don't even have that. So just got to make sure that this corner is. Are you finding right now that you're getting a little creamier yeah. coverage? Yeah. Starting to fill in a little bit easier. Yeah. I'm definitely seeing that over here. Now when I'm sort of jabbing at the gills, it's just pulling some fibers away. So. Yeah. Just make sure that we got as few air bubbles in the fibers as we can. No black gaps showing through. Yep, stick with the brush. A brush set. Switching to fingers. I'll pop over there too. I'm almost done with my side. While well, Ted's getting that worked up. Pop over there. Okay. Yeah, we got good coverage here. Do you have a washing bucket? No. Not in here. Of course, I'm going to cover something. Clean off this brush. Oh, that looks good. What you worried about, girly? You know. I'm worried. Always good to have another set of eyes on it, though. Yep, it looks like you got better coverage on the burlap. So we'll just have to worry about getting a little bit more burlap in this shoulder area, maybe a little bit over here. Okay. And then um, quickly overall with what we have remaining, and then we'll do our cream coat over the whole thing. But it's looking good. Yes, right behind you. Right behind you. Yes, Greg, what about the new Universal Monsters? Um, yeah, I'm I'm on the fence, honestly, my friend. I, I want to show support to uh, their concept of Dark Universe is what they were calling it originally. And I know that it's kind of fluid because they're doing a bunch of different concepts with it, you know, going back and forth. And now they're saying that it, they might not be all interconnected, probably because of the poor performance of the mummy. But some of the concepts I was so excited to see more come from. So I do kind of hope that they continue, but they got to get a better idea of the stories of their characters. They have to own those characters a little bit better because, you know, the thing that made the old ones cool, I don't know that they would fly today, except with us older guys that, you know, we grew up with it. Guys and girls that, you know, were of our age, say the. 60s, 70s kids, but I just, I feel like they don't even know their own characters in a lot of cases. It's just a shame that the last great movies that came out, I loved Wolfman, by the way. I know that they weren't officially saying that that was a part of Dark Universe, but I did like the Wolfman. Um, Dave Elsie and... Um, Rick Baker did an amazing job on the makeup, kept it kind of current and modern by making it 
a little more visceral, but it was very, very well done as far as the makeup and the choice of everything. And I'm not even really, I hope I don't offend anyone, but I'm not a huge fan of Benicio Del Toro, but I think he did a really good job in the role of Larry Talbot. It was weird after knowing the old universe so well, and then all of a sudden he's an actor in the U.S. rather than someone that went there to, to study and did optics and stuff. He was a little bit more, I guess, worldly, being, being in university and stuff like that. But even that, if you stretched it, wasn't necessarily the most believable that, you know, Lawrence Talbot goes to the U.S. and is evidently gone enough to totally lose his accent. Everyone else is talking basically like, you know, with the English accent, and he's still, he's become Americanized, I guess you'd say. So where else can you... I think that was my biggest concern. I've got one here that I need to do. But honestly, from the commercials, from the trailers and stuff, I didn't even see The Mummy. It just seemed such a far departure. I could forgive an awful lot, but... No wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, the Van Helsing, that was kind of under Stephen Stummer's reign. And I liked his mummy. I liked the Brendan Fraser mummy in the Van Helsing. It was modern and still had a lot of the old class to it. Um, Brendan Fraser, I know that it was a little more comical and they added a little humor here and there and a few jabs, but it was still pretty good. I just saw that movie for the first time. It was yeah. very good. I enjoyed it. I liked it. It was a throwback to the old serials, which a lot of the old Universal Monster movies kind of were, you know, with that mentality. But just disappointed in the new universe that they have so far. Okay, now we can just apply more material over this. I wouldn't do that yet. <laughs> no. Just apply it the old-fashioned way. Yeah. That was the most gangster-esque noise. Yeah, see? I think he got snooey hands trying to remove plastic from brush symbols, oh. or brush sounds. This one's sliding stuff. That's okay. Just. It's just added strength down that well, chinny chin. Brush chin. Is also oh, that. Setting. Well, that and the brush is setting again. Yep. I'm Move grab, along. I'm going to grab along. a tiny brush. So I didn't waste my time by not seeing it. I, I didn't miss anything good then, Rob, right? <laughs> what do you say? He said the Tom Cruise mummy was awful. And that's all I've heard is everyone said it was awful. I heard that too. Don't they, waste they, your they, time. Do you remember when they released the trailer the first time? They released it without sound in the yes. set. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I'm not the hugest fan of Tom Cruise. I mean, he's had some good movies. Don't get me wrong. But this one by the trailer, I was just totally left scratching my head saying, okay. How is this the mummy? Yeah, and it wasn't that it was a female mummy. I thought that would have been a cool mm -hmm. a cool switch on it. Definitely. But just everything else, I'm like, okay, this doesn't even make sense. You know, and to me, a mummy movie, if they're going to call, uh, if they're going to have a universal mummy movie, it's going to be the, the story that we were used to, like Im Imhotep. Or some version of it, you know. I don't care if they bring in new characters or sequels, but at least have Imhotep, because that's like having a Frankenstein movie without Boris, like a, a, a Boris Karloff monster type thing, or a Wolfman movie, and it's not the Wolfman. The Wolfman. It's Corgi Man. Yes. Or it's Wolfman, but now we're making him a tiger. Yeah, he's going to be a were tiger. No. I love the concept of War Tiger. It's pretty cool. It works on, uh, on what's that one? The Texas, Midnight Texas? 
I love the concept. The guy was a great character. It's my big complaint with Skyrim and yeah. the, uh, the Elder Scroll games is you can play as a Khajiit, like a cat person. Yeah. But if you get um, like in Groupie, I, I, no, I said that wrong. I'm terrible. Like Okay, that's how you say it. Uh, but you turn into a dog. Like if you're a cat person, I don't think you should be turning into a dog. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Because when humans do it, it makes so much sense. I mean, it makes more sense. <laughs> I'm a wear lizard. I'm a wear. That happens to the. I'm a wear gecko. That happens to your dogs too. You might have diseases and stuff. I am a wear gecko. So not only am I going to turn into a lizard, but I'm going to sell the insurance. No. <laughs> I just I want it to be, I want it to make sense. That's it. You know, um, I don't care if they divert, but have it make sense. Uh, you probably should not be giving them ideas. Yes, because they are watching. They're watching. They're like, listening. Oh, where gecko? <laughs> Some gecko employee's like, yes. Get off my lawn, Flo. Yeah, insurance commercials never used to be as entertaining as they are now. Yeah, do you think maybe one day they'll have, like, the little CGI gecko, and he'll be in a wrestling ring, because they always have, like, weird things about that. Yeah. And then on the other side, all you see is, like, this silhouette of Flo. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> I think one day we're going to see a full-fledged movie about the, uh, the Geico. Are we going to get a movie or a show about the caveman for a while? Yeah, they were talking about that. Um, I, I'm seeing it just now, but the Dracula remake um, that you're talking about, Carl, um, which one is that? Like the Gary Oldman uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, because that one was good. I did like the literal translation for the most part, even though, you know, the description was a little weird in the book compared to what we got, but I thought it did. they did it well. Um, what we do in the shadows. Oh, yeah, what we do in the shadows. And Gary Oldman, I mean, come on. Well, Gary Oldman is such a, a chameleon, no pun intended, but he can become anything. Him and Christian Bale pretty much morph their appearance to any need and can act differently. And Vincent D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio. I liked such a Dracula movie. Untold. Um, that's the one the guy also played Gaston. Um, huh? Yeah, the guy that played Gaston, and he's been in a bunch of stuff. You'd recognize him. The voice actor um, from the live action. The live action, okay. Beauty and the Beast. Um, you mean auto-tune the movie? Yes. I can't remember the guy's name in, in real life. For some reason, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. But in Dracula Untold, he was freaking amazing. And it was such an original take on it, the reluctant uh, vampire. But it was so well done. It was so well done. And I know that they left it in a place where it really wouldn't need a sequel. But that was one of those movies that at the end I was like, oh, my God, I want to see more. That was pretty damn cool. I hate when I can't remember people's names, but I, it's that taking is literally my every day. It's taking longer for the old man to get hit the filing cabinet. I still keep calling um, sneaking Batista barista. Yes, you know barista. WWE, Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah, barista. <laughs> I think it could definitely continue as a series. Mm -hmm. They could tell stories on the Dracula Untold, different stories and different uh, conquests in both time frames. Because it was a cool movie. Even the setup was cool. And these sort of conversations are not off topic for us. This is generally no. what we talk about when we're doing this. Yeah, when we're busy, we're drifting from comics to monsters to actors. Every once in a while, we'll drift into politics, you know, because there's so much, even though you consider, oh, well, politics, but 
so much of it applies to our industry as well with things that get done and you know we were complaining um, back when it happened the tariffs that now take take over things there's so many of our materials that are imported um, that just couldn't be made here so it's not even about products it's about materials and then our prices go up and we have to charge more because it costs more to get raw silicone or it costs more to do um, urethanes so we drift into politics We talk about just about everything. New art programs. Lately, our our conversations have been preoccupied by doing live streams and stuff like that because if we're doing it in our kind of chosen profession, it's got to be something where people can see what we're doing, and that's the hardest thing is being able to afford the necessary materials that we need uh, and the equipment that we need to do this as a second thing because we're doing one and doing the other. Oh, wash. I think. Do we need that next? Yep, we'll start with two and then figure out how much thicker than that we need to go. Because that was like half a kitty coat there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was mostly, you know, that was like splitting a, a burlap coat for beauty coat. Ooh, did you see um, Boston Dynamics as a new robot? No. Hey, well, I'm waiting for that to ash up a little bit. I got something cool to show you. Well, not cool, it's terrifying, but you know. <laughs> This is Skynet. No, it's not. Well, I don't know yet. Well, maybe. Maybe a little Skynet. I'm not going to say no. <laughs> the way we've been going, I'm almost okay with that. Maybe we need a little Skynet. Oh, yeah. Amazon bird. <laughs> Can pack your shit from... Oh. I give up. Yeah, she's showing a, a video on uh, Reddit. Boston Dynamics robot doing heavy warehouse work. That's just lovely. If you haven't seen it, essentially just imagine like uh, robot ostriches with battery pack behinds moving around and moving boxes around in a warehouse. Battery pack behinds. I'm using People on Reddit were calling it something else. Oh, I, 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 you're trying to keep it respectable. I mean, that, that's the kind of trunk space you want a late, in a late model sedan. That would be a cool rumor. I think, I think she did well in Maleficent, even though it was a departure again from the original story. I was good with that. But she is so wacky. I mean, but so are we. I don't know if we're anyone to talk about it. Everyone's... Separate the art from the artist. Yeah. We can do this. Okay. Batch and a half. Yes, this will be uh, technically the first real beauty coat. Okay. And we'll probably, judging by the thickness that I'm seeing here, We'll probably need our three coats for this as well. And make it a little bit thicker than than last time if we can. Because ideally we would like to see all this kind of very, I, I don't want to say smooth, but all of the angles will be gone once we get it to that thickness. And again, if I'm looking down the center line of the molds, we only have about an eighth, maybe between an eighth and a quarter inch thickness from our midline up. So we're going to have to add quite a bit to this. We've got our burlap in there, but we have to have a little more strength to that material. A little more heft. Yes. And we've still got maybe a quarter of a bag of material left. And I think. If I remember correctly, we do have a partial bag of Hydrocal. It's older, but we do have one. Okay. I don't want to use that if I can help it. Because this stuff does have an age. You know, if you go past a year, you may experience some issues. And we definitely want to avoid that with this. Uh, 
Greg Altman says, Scott, do you see yourself sculpting more of the original Universal Monsters? Well, um, I don't know if you guys, if you saw it, Greg. I did um, a Frankenstein last year. We had a hurricane that blew through Ocala. So I'm like, i got to get my mind off of this negativity. So I sat down at the table inside, away from the shop, and I started sculpting a Boris Karloff Frankenstein. So I finished him last, late last year, like between Halloween and, and Christmas. Um, this year is, is Gilman, obviously. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I would do next, but yes, it is my intention to do more of the classic Universal Monsters. I, I've been toying with uh, Wolfman. I was going to say, you want to do the Wolfman. Lon Chaney Wolfman. But, but the herring on that is just... Gonna yeah, be the fun. herring. Oh, it'll be fun, though. Let's see. It'll be like doing a Chewbacca. If you're, doing, fun, if you're doing herring, if you're doing a project like the Wolfman, especially the 1941 Wolfman, I would want to do it just like Jack Pierce did. Oh, and we may use for... different materials, but like for the hair, use the yak hair, but glue it down. It was, a fur, was it a fur transfer or was it just glued? glued down. It was layer glued, and that's why sometimes you see him at certain angles, and you can see the, the kind of oh. stuck look, but Jack, to try to counter that, he used a hot, hot iron, a curling iron, and singed the yak hair, so it looked oh. all kinky and frizzy, but um, but we could do that, and then just at the front where we want it to be very clean, instead of gluing it on, because that for that light, for makeup, it's fine because you can do touch-ups and you're doing another scene and you change it. But for this, I would probably punch that close-up hair. Um, that would be right in the, the visual line. But I do want to do that. I would love to do a, a Bela Lugosi Dracula. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the idea. I would love to do more of them. It's just a time thing. And, and most of those I do as um, spec pieces, you know, so people can see the range of our work because so much of the stuff we did over the last two years, I couldn't tell anyone about. So here we're doing amazing things, and everyone that works in the shop is like, oh, that's cool, this is cool, this is cool, we can't tell anyone. So last two years has been hard. So we have tried to do spec pieces that can still showcase what we do. Greg said a real good Wolfman mask is so hard to find nowadays. Yeah, yeah, and if we did it, in, if we did it for a silicone piece, we could very easily do some silicone poles, Ecoflex like silicone poles. I have to get Ecoflex poles. Yeah, yeah, but that would be nice. Having a full pullover, high detail, high likeness. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be experimenting with other materials here pretty soon, I think. But there is a rich table of monsters, and I know I could like sell them and license them because the expense would be crazy. But at least for you know a spec piece that we're doing for the studio to put into the into the um, you know showroom type thing and take to shows, that would be awesome. Greg says, so this is a production thing you're doing now. Um, yes, this. Uh, you mean for the. If you're talking about the creature mask, yes, this is going to be a part of a full suit that we're doing for the deliberation. So as far as more general, um, the studio that we do does stuff like this all the time. But it's like a lot of it we can't really show because of NDAs. But this particular one is for deliberation. You did say you wanted to design your own werewolf mask at some point. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, again, it's a spec piece, so it always gets back burner to the paying jobs to come in. But it's kind of like a double-edged sword. You wind up working all the time because you've got all this work that you are getting, but you can't tell anyone about. And then you got to do work just so you can show it, you know, so people don't think you disappeared. Because I did a lot of shows. We all did. Um, Ted is the model for a lot of the makeup demos that we did. And the last two years, we had to turn down so much because we were in deadlines all the time. And now that we're trying to get back into it, a lot of the shows, you know, they forget about you if you've gone for two years. And then it's like, oh, you want to come back? Oh, okay. I thought you had dried up and fallen off the vine or something. <laughs> no. No, vine died. Yeah, Greg said bummer. I was hoping you were selling this. Yeah, we... 
the only way I could get around that, because I really don't want to step on any toes, is there will be um, basically a way for us to make up some of the expense of doing the suit, and that would be to offer a very small number to people that are interested. But we have to be very careful with what we do because we do work with a lot of the people in this industry. So we have to be careful about what we solicit, um, you know, because we don't want to step on copyright, especially since they've been so gracious with everything else for the deliberation. That's not our intention with this. But if we could sell a, a small number like 10 pieces, 10 masks or, or display busts, um, then that would help us with costs and allow us to do this to begin with because it's hard to raise money and at least if someone is getting something out of it they're much more able to support you and help you out so more information on that coming soon we just don't know anything yet because when you're doing this phase of it you're finding out everything about your costs and even once you get the suit done and you pull your first casting then you're like okay we know what it costs to get to this point but now how much is it going to cost us to reproduce one or how much is it going to cost to do the assembly or the painting? Because, again, this is going to be done just like the original suit. Um, there will be pieces that get pieced onto a, a, you know, a spandex suit or an undersuit. Um, and we don't know what that labor is going to be. Most of it's stuff that we can do in-house, which is cool, because we don't have to worry about outsourcing for a lot. But, you know, we do have expenses that we're only figuring out as we go, if that makes sense. But we're definitely trying to make some available to defray the costs. That's kind of true for every project like this. You never, ever know how long it's going to take or what it's going to take. You can kind of guess. Yeah. But because everything's different, you and, just sort of have to figure it out as you go. And quite honestly, a bad bid can shut a shop down. You know, if you don't know what your costs are, you hit snags. We've all had it you wind up losing thousands of dollars on a bid because you left something out. And, you know, on the smaller projects, that's not a big deal. When you're working huge projects, oh, my gosh, you know, you have a, a decimal out of place, you can get screwed up. But even just estimating amount of materials, the bigger the project, the, the harder it is to come up with an exact material size. But I think, like I said, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of, when we're going to be able to do it and how we're going to be able to do it legally. Um, we may put together um, internally a sponsorship package where you can sponsor the finished product. So we're not really selling uh, a suit. We're just doing it as, uh, okay, if you do this, you'll get a suit or something like that or a mask. But I don't want to step on Universal's toes with this at all. You get situations where, what's that old phrase, never poop where you eat? I thought it was don't bite the hand that feeds you. That too. And don't poop on the hand that feeds you either. And don't pee upstream. Upwind. Yeah. Oh. Don't, for the benefit of other swimmers, don't pee upstream. <laughs> That's what and I don't saying. do it in Silver Spring State Park either, because <laughs> Ted might be in the water practicing. <laughs> Oh boy. I don't know. They love me. State bird. The, the mosquito. mosquito. <laughs> State food. Chelsea for the mosquito. If you're new to joining the stream, we are in the final stage, the final part of this mask mold. This is the first, first real beauty coat. We did a blended beauty coat in the last step. But we're just throwing more material on it to get up to that minimum material thickness. Base is definitely going to need some more, by the way. Yeah, I figured. We have a pretty darn good thickness everywhere else, but the base. I still need more. Oh, you mean on the on the mold wall or the base. yeah, yeah. Mold wall is is going to need more per, uh, 
material too. But we got two more batches hopefully to do on it. And we're still using the same technique of kind of just glazing material over the top, letting it fall off of the brush. You're noticing we're not really trying to get a lot of brush strokes in here because if you have brush strokes, too much material is falling off of your, your brush and you're just down to the bristles. So we're just trying to use it more like a trowel. And it's almost getting to that point where it's starting to cream and turn into a different consistency. So keeping it very wet. Yeah, definitely pack it in from the side as well so we're getting enough coverage in the fibers. About the time we finish this, we got to start planning our mode of attack on the gloves and the boots, which is another reason we want this to be something that is sculpted entirely in-house. We don't want to go outside because it is for a charity function, and we don't want to step on anyone's monster toes either. I think he doesn't even love it this week, wet man. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to go as quickly as we can because, yeah, it's always like you're depriving your creation of oxygen when he's sitting under that stuff. And quite honestly, we don't really breathe until we get him out of the mold. You know, anything can happen. We, it's been a long time, knock on wood, that we've had any kind of mold fail, but you always kind of worry about that until he's out. Be sure we're getting enough material on that side. I can't see, so I'm trusting your guy, your eye over there. If you want, you can, um, we'll rotate again. Okay. We can do that. And this side is pretty much full. The only, only exception of maybe working the flange a little more if we need to. Uh, we've got a good coat on the other. Okay. And then we'll be ready for the next. What feature do you spot? This is the first time I see you live. Ah, um, yes, this is the mask that you've probably seen on my page, the Creature from the Black Lagoon mask. So this is him second day in in the molding process. We're working on the front now. We did the we usually do the front first and then we're able to flip it over and do the, the back, but the fin presented interesting issues. So yes, this is the classic 1954 creature from the Black Lagoon. Rather big mold because it's all the way, you know, down mid-chest for his uh, bib line. And then we have a little base that's on there as well. Yep. So this is relatively late in the game. We're basically past our um, our print coats, we are past our burlap layer, and now we're building up mass, basically just adding material so we have strength. And maybe another, I want to say maybe another, uh, after this batch that's being prepped, maybe uh, one more tops, and then we're just going to be overdoing it as far as weight goes. <laughs> already a pretty big boy. Yep. Just in dry material, not accounting for waste, we've gone through almost two full bags of uh, Hydrocal, which is 50 pounds a bag. So 
once the water comes out, it'll get lightened up a little bit, but still. Once water comes out, it'll be 100 pounds. Yep. Yeah. Yep, because it's actually going to be, when we're trying to demold this sucker, there's still going to be a lot of water in it. So we're looking at over 100 pounds, not counting here and there a little bit of waste from leaving it in the bucket. So it's a heavy brother. And, and also the 20 pounds of clay original. Yes, the clay in there, yep. Greg says, for Bean Floridians, two of you look like you're from Minnesota. Um, is, is that a judgment on, on our... Pallor. Our pallor. <laughs> so which two? <laughs> um, well, originally I was from New York, but I moved from there from when I was four. But with all the studio work we're doing, we very rarely see the sun, which we have to change that. Studio. At least a sunroof. Okay, I think it's at that point, Chelsea, where we can start. If you need a new brush, get a new brush if that one's starting to get really sticky, but we're just um, starting the process, evening out. I'm no sure I'm... this was one of those uh, dusting brushes. I'll just take this one. Ah, okay. It was in the box. We're starting the process of uh, the beauty coat, which is just prep work. It's knocking down all of the really bad areas, evening stuff out where we can, because it's kind of gotten to that that um, kind of leathery texture almost. We get a nice roundness on everything. No stress risers. No. I would say you texture something like when you're at the beach and the sand is just kind of wet. Yeah. Not too shabby. Now that the material is on there, this is the only exception to uh, how we normally apply it when I say no brush strokes, because at this point we're trying to even out and prep for the next layer. And we know the material is still green and we know that it's got a little bit of texture, so we're good. It also helps the next layer grip on a little bit. Yes, there's more of a mechanical bond. And we already see after that last batch, that medium line is much more equal. So we added probably at least an eighth of an inch just from that last batch. Maybe even a little more. So we're catching up. And we still have plenty of material. Easily enough for one more batch if we need it. Yeah. And I think we'll probably be looking at one more batch for sure. Greg says your father-in-law has a great tan. Yes. It's uh, probably, yeah. I, well, you have the ability to tan at least. <laughs> I, we, I, I unfortunately just didn't pass that on to my daughter. No. No, I, I burn, Amber burns, Chelsea burns. Actually, I don't burn today. Well, for a day, right? Isn't that what it usually does? It flares yeah. up, and then the next day you're fine. And mm -hmm. then the next day it's tan. That, that, that happens to me, too. Stella. Stella's yeah. a pretty good Actually, tear. last time I did that, though, I did burn. Yeah. And I was feeling real weak. I was surprised. Yeah. That hasn't happened to me in forever. Uh, Kimber Spore says, how long does it usually take for you to do a piece of this size? Um, the bust itself, I think... If I remember correctly, we had about 40 hours in the sculpt, which usually it's about 27, but this one went closer to 40. Um, and the molding was all day yesterday, and uh, at least 12 hours yesterday, and uh, since about 12.30 today. So I was thinking it'd probably be about three hours today, and we're pretty close to that. So now that doesn't include the rest because that's a very big variable but we are going to be doing the whole suit the hands the feet the body everything so by the end it could be a thousand hours so you'll you'll need a different pose on the hands just like that yep. okay. straight up 
because we'll have to extend the fingers a little bit. So when you put on the glove, we'll have a zipper. Uh, probably a zipper. We can't get it on exactly, and then you have Delcro. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. No, I no. hope they will let you down into the springs at least for a short time. Greg's asking, what is this thing going away when it's completed? Not a clue. Mm -hmm. The entire suit. Yeah, we'll only know that when we get it when we get it cast. I mean, the mask isn't going to be too bad. Um, and quite honestly, I mean, you know the way to latex. We're going to go fairly thin. Uh, we want to avoid any kind of buckling or anything like that. But it's going to be thin, and then that's going to be uh, glued to a bodysuit. So. If it's going to be fairly light, I would think. If you're talking about the mold, anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds. Yeah. Yeah, at least. And the bodysuit, we are going to break up into, uh, into sections. So that will be a little bit different. And overlapping sections like they did on the original. Yes. Yes, we are going to have to do overlapping sections, so... That'll be fun. It still won't necessarily preclude us from doing a hell of a display piece and using those same scale sections on a body form, on a mannequin. I get a cloaca. <sighs> You're all excited. Yeah, he, he's going to have a, a, a little pea flap on his suit. Oh. So, you know, because he's going to have to go to the bathroom in it. Yeah. Hopefully not in it. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about things like that. How are, We don't want to have to remove his whole suit so he can use the restroom. So we'll have to hide a couple of snaps or something. So, so that means no Taco Bell. No. <laughs> no. We're going to put you on like a medical diet you can't eat for 12 hours before. Greg said something. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, he's saying, "Wow, yeah, this the the mold itself is going to be heavy." And you guys will get to see the demolding. It's always scary for us to do that mm -hmm. live because you're seeing it with us. We should charge admission for that. Believe me, but that's going to be a, a fun day. Yeah, fun. Careful, let's splash it a little bit. Go a little looser with your brush. Okay. Remember, we're not brushing it on much less. Like We're just kind of like slapping it on. Really trying to build up the space thickness. Yeah, the best way to do that is kind of just slap it on like that. That way we're going to get ma massive amounts of material on there and we're not brushing it off with the same brush stroke. Again, I'd like to remind everyone a couple of things. Um, if you're joining us now, we got 13 viewers now at this time, so we've gained, gained a couple. Remember to like our page, like the event page. Uh, Hearts of Reality presents Gilibration for all the up-to-date uh, information on that. We're going to be adding a lot over the next few weeks, um, so stay tuned to that. I'd like to thank my current sponsors, of course. Pache Airbrush, Chuck Passion over there. He has been a huge help with our studio and great products. Always helping us out with, you know, technical information and never had a fail on it. So I definitely would only support a company like that if they had great products. So trust me. And everything is kind of like artist preference, I realize. So you may get one and not absolutely love it like I do, but if you're new to it and you want to try a great airbrush, it's definitely a good place to start. And that includes also all your compressors and replacement part needs, everything like that. And then if you would like to continue to support Give Kids the World or Hearts of Reality, um, you can check the link through my main page. It's uh, the support give kids the world dot org. 
um, if you look up my name, you can actually contribute to our fundraiser for the Hearts of Reality event this August 10th. And uh, that's where we really get to contribute through the donations from our friends and people that want to support what we're doing. So we would definitely appreciate that. But I know that's asking a lot because a lot of people are going to be coming out to the creature event, and I would never expect you to do both. But if you were looking for a quick way to support it, you can always reach out to us that way. Hate doing the business end of things, but it definitely helps out the organization. And with like 95 to 97 percent of what they bring in going directly to kids, I can get behind that kind of organization. Yep, we'll probably need just one more coat after this. Sweet. Making better this time than looking... we thought. Once we get this one on, we'll be able to judge, because we still have quite a bit of material in the pot. Mm -hmm. And I like what I'm seeing as far as the height building up around the flange. Got to be sure to have a strong enough wall there. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure love the bargain head, don't I? Yeah. Yes, we will definitely be having live broadcasts at Gillibration for sure. Probably all day long we'll have little updates and stuff, especially <laughs> when the creature makes his debut. But we also have musical guests that will be there. We're a um, good friend of Gillibration, um, Kilted Creature. Um, we're working on getting him out there for a, a performance. We'll probably be having pickups from the various Q&As and autograph stations that we're going to have set up for the stars. So we're going to try to make it accessible. Even if you can't be there, we'll have some way of broadcasting the uh, event. Hope they have good Wi-Fi out there. Yes. And I know that we've talked to several people who may want to cover it as like an event where they come out and actually broadcast from the event live. So if we do that, we'll have all the links or at least information on how you can get get on the the viewing watch. I think we need, I think we need to get OCD out there. Yes, yeah. We've already talked about um, some good friends of ours at OCD, Orlando Collectors Deviants, and um, because of their long-term relationship with us and their support, they're going to be covering some more things like this with the production of the suit, um, doing live broadcasts from here. So you'll see them, and they'll probably have a lot to do with, you know, broadcasting what they see and what they do out at the celebration as well. Chicken's going crazy again. Yes. As bad as hey, hey. <laughs> I still can't believe the motion. And their chicken or peacock. I know you said there's some wild ones in the area. Wild chickens? Peacocks. Oh, said. peacocks, yeah. Yeah. I don't know about the wild chickens. I'm sure we've got some. I'm sure. Rural life. Ooh, I forgot to tell you, I recorded a bunch of coyotes the other night. Uh, I heard those around here, too. We've got them, but I don't know where they are because it seems like it's coming from the direction of the the Dollar General up that way. Mm -hmm. they, they're probably in uh, Indian Pines. Uh, their hells are designed to carry distance. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there was some around my house. You know how there's like a dirt road right next to the far side of our uh, of the grove. Yes, they were. Uh, it sounded like they were on there, and Sebastian was flipping out. Mm-hmm. Sounded like they were on the edge of our property. Oh, jeez. That is a sound that you don't forget. Mm-mm. Last year, it was probably fall of last year, I heard something. It was the weirdest sound I had ever heard because it sounded just like, and I'm not I'm not making this up, it sounded just like the werewolf howl from American Werewolf in London. That was a bit unnerving. You heard a wendigo. Yes, I couldn't. Skinwalker or something. I I couldn't I couldn't record it fast enough, but I'm like, oh my god, because it's such a distinct towel that he had in that movie. And then I heard it, and I'm like, oh, um, yeah, stay off the more. Or that, or someone has the best custom car horn ever. Yes, that gives me an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Another batch and a half. Yes, I think, uh, let's do a batch and a half, but that might be it. That might be the last one. Again, I'm monitoring um, mostly the wall thickness, because I know if I got wall thickness here and here, then the rest is good, because we're getting a pretty even coating on it. Definitely nearing the end. Yes, yes. Doing that clumpy thing. I think that's it. That's it for this batch. Go ahead and plop some of this corner. It's getting very firm. Mm. My brush then too. Uh, Greg put. Oh no! It's snowing again. Arg. Snowing again. That sucks, right? Oh man. Okay. Got a wiggle behind you. Yeah, we've got good coverage on this thing so far. Well, yeah, you've got a camera directly over it. Yes. You see where our halfway part is here, Chelsea, where the... Mm. Yeah. That was a tree branch, everyone. Right here. Yeah. Here and here. So we've built up a lot of thickness. It's a little thinner at the edge, but Mm -hmm. up here, it's good. How's that sound? Uh, Let me take a look. One, two, maybe three. So we're close. We are close. I think that this last batch and a half will be enough to get us the coverage we need. So this will effectively be our beauty coat. <laughs> but it's getting there, guys. I didn't have to find this yesterday. And there is Trish Halsey. Was your, were your ears burning? I was just talking about OCD coming out and covering uh, some of the creation of the suit and the event itself. This is the Trish Halsey and her husband Steve. They, they run OCD, the Orlando they Collectors. Are. They, they, yeah, they are OCD. And I think everyone that's kind of a part of their little clique is OCD. Yeah. It's like we are Negan, we are OCD. <laughs> Can definitely relate to the title, to the name of the, the group. Mm-hmm. 
but yeah, we met them through the convention cir circles um, a few years back, and they just became great friends to us, supporting mm -hmm. us and kind of getting the word out and what we were trying to do. And we've done personal stuff on the outside with them, so we we like them. They can hang their family. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm sure glad that this is the last coat. <laughs> this is convenient. We are officially out of brushes, both two inch and one inch. Just enough. Yes. But I really think this will be the last one anyway. It's looking really good. I would definitely focus on the flange uh, and the corners up here. Yep. And then we'll just even everything else out. Okie dokie. So we're coming up on the last, probably last half hour of this. So that's not too bad. 1230 mm -hmm. to by the time we hit this, it'll be three. So two and a half hours. I know what you're thinking of. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. Maybe. I got Scott hooked on boba tea. Yes. And it's good for you. Nice taro, uh, you know, frozen. Well, then it's not frozen, is it? What do they it's call frozen. it? The frozen? Mm -hmm. Frozen uh, frozen tea, taro, and then pomegranate uh, popping, boba. Popping boba. Popping boba. You try the juicy ones at some point. Maybe. I just like, I like the juice of the pomegranate. It's one of my favorite, you know, fruits. A lot of work. Maybe that's why I like it so much. If you if you want to have pomegranate, you got to work for it. Yeah, true. It's, it's one of my favorite fruits too. I always feel a little bit like Persephone. Or, I don't know how you say that. Uh, it's Persephone. Greek. It is Persephone. Yeah. Oh, hey, I got a name right. Woo! Yay me! I'm excited. Persephone. Is it Persephone? God is so Persephone. <laughs> Persephone. Like we're painting we with a bunch of comments, by the way. Painting with a bunch of happy little clouds. Yes, absolutely, uh, Greg. I don't know if that'll be today, but we'll definitely uh, keep everyone posted on the demolding. And Sandika, um, Scott, remember the fine art, the fan art I posted. Yes. Thank you so much. That was so cool. Um, yeah, because I was on Face Off, um, this kind gentleman did fan art with me and a lot of the other co-stars uh, from the seasons on Face Off. So, Sandeeka, thank you very much for that. It's um, always amazing to see what um, fans, and I, I have a hard time using that phrase because I'm, I'm such like a normal dude, it's not even funny. Um, I don't consider myself a star or anything like that, but then one of you guys comes out and does a fan art piece that just melts my heart. So thank you for for doing that and liking the work that we did on on Face Off. I appreciate that, and it, I think it's still posted on my um, my regular Facebook profile. So if you look back a few posts, you'll see that, and it's it's a pretty cool. And also, Sandika, if you want to repost it. Um, you can do that to get that in the timeline as well because it was really, really cute. Thank you very much. Uh, check out his other work as well if you have a chance. Very cool artist. <coughs> Are we pretty much focusing on the? Mm -hmm. I'm occasionally wall. brushing up, but for the most part, I'm just depositing, letting it ash a little yes, bit, and depositing. That's more. exactly right. That's exactly right. I want to build that up nice and sturdy. 
once that starts to set, you can also probably do a little bit of a fillet at the top of that where it joins the, the body of the sculpt so it's a little more rounded. That's bonus. Once that starts to set throughout, we'll probably do a pour over since this is horizontal now. We'll take what's left and do a horizontal pour over and then final blend with that. Depending on how this starts to cream, that might be easier than just brushing and brushing and brushing. This is not recognizable as the creature anymore. No, but he kind of looks like the bad guy from the end of Ghostbusters. <laughs> you know, no, I'm looking at the picture there. Snow Trooper. <laughs> yes. Put some black here and here. Snow Trooper. <laughs> Well, we will definitely look into um, the comment crossed out about editing this down. Um, we definitely have that in our sites. We're looking at that as an option, editing it down as a how-to video, also making it a part of a comprehensive video that covers the planning, the execution, and the day of the uh, gillibration, because there's so much stuff that we have to do with this creatively. That would be a whole documentary. Yeah, that will be a documentary. Um, many of you might have seen uh, the name Michael Canal come up um, on my posts. And we are doing something uh, special for the event leading up to it, uh, kind of like a, a road to the Black Lagoon that will have a lot of this information in there plus a bunch of other information, but delivered in a little bit more of a comedic kind of um, fashion. So look forward to that as well because we are going to be doing um, a lot over the next few months as well with that but we have a, a great love for you know the monster movies we were both monster kids products of the six of the 70s and late 60s where all those monster movies really came to the forefront and uh, we grew up with all of the, the oh don't do that <laughs> what do you do it got, got in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, the Jason song? It's in my hair. <laughs> what? <laughs> Do I want to hear the story? Uh, no. Okay, never mind. Yeah, I'm no, good. no, no. I'm good. Uh, yeah, that that was that was fun. I'm awake. <laughs> I'm awake. Just checking. I got pelted with droplets of either bird shit or, or plaster. I don't know. There was a bird in here that one time. I know we have had a bird in here. Bird, lizards. I like the lizards. That one, that one time the rat got in here. I don't know how that happened. It's like, no yeah. thanks. I love living in the country. Like spend all day trying to catch this rat, and then we set up our 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 traps. I I always go no kill first. I try to do the no kill. But when they evade and evade and evade and then they start eating things that they shouldn't, I got to put out harsher and harsher traps. So before doing the one that would just, you know, chop them in half because that, uh, I don't know, it's probably not any better for them. But I put down the sticky ones that we could at least attempt to get them out of and, and set them free. Well, we caught one that looked at our sticky mat and said, challenge accepted. So we went, we went out and actually saw... This, uh, this rat stuck in the trap, and it was still alive. And we were checking like every every few hours just to make sure because I couldn't let it just suffer anyway. But survival of the fittest. So we caught and released that. 